In 2019, we were exposed to primary care networks and they have had a seismic impact on general practice. Almost every practice across the country has been involved and a person leading the charge to share the information about how primary care networks can be even more effective has been Ben Gowan from the General Practice Podcast. In this episode of the EGP Learning Podblast, Andy and myself speak to him about his journey over the past year, learn the lessons that he's had, as well as share some more stories. In addition, we hear about his expectations for the coming year and share a few of our own, as well as recap what we've been up to over the past year. We hope you find this episode really enjoyable. As always, feel free to contact us on any of the social media platforms and make sure you subscribe so you can hear all of our episodes. But let's get straight to that interview with Ben. Remember, at EGP Learning, we're here to help save you and your patient's time by tech enhancing your primary care and learning. Shall we begin? Hi everybody and welcome to this episode of the EGP Learning Pod Blast where we are joined by Ben Gowland. Uh, hello Ben. Hi, nice to be here. How are you doing today? Doing really good, really good. Thanks for inviting me on. Great to be back. Definitely. Uh, well, we're glad to have you here. I mean, we know you've had an amazing year um, in terms of the podcast that you've been up to. And also uh, you and I obviously had the really amazing opportunity to speak at the RCGP conference together as well, which was um, definitely monumental. That was a, a fun thing, I have to admit. And, and I think you were on Ben's podcast recently as well, Gandhi. Oh, yeah. Forgot about that. Shouldn't really forget about that. But yeah, thank you for having me. Um, but yeah, so we wanted to do this episode where it basically we kind of did a year in review of what we've been up to and also, Ben, what you've been up to, because like I said, you've been doing some really amazing stuff. Um, just in case any of our listeners don't know who you are, though, which I really doubt, how about you introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. So um, my name's Ben Gound. I'm, um, I'm director of Ockham Healthcare. And I guess the, the thing that a lot of people now know me for is we run the general practice podcast where we've been uh, doing we do episodes on all things general practice and I guess quite a key focus this year has been on primary care networks and like you said it's is I mean we've talked about it a few times obviously both Andy and myself being clinical directors of primary care networks but it's been um, probably one of the most groundbreaking and earth shattering things that's happened to primary care for a while in terms of shifts and, and stuff um, but I guess from your perspective what kind of things ha- have you seen and the impact it's had um, in terms of people you've been speaking with. Well, it's been an interesting year, hasn't it? Right from, you know, the, the new contract came out, I think it was January the 31st. And then there was this whole period of what does it mean? And there was this real thirst for information. And I don't know if you remember, so the contract was out, then we were waiting for the kind of specification on what is a primary mm-hmm. care network and what's going to be involved. And then, then there was this whole uh, sort of shift into actually getting them set up, you know, so a kind of, is it better to be 30,000 or 50,000? And can you get a few more link workers if you're 30,000 rather than 50,000? And then, and then into the whole governance and agreements and games of musical chairs to see who was left as the clinical director. So mm-hmm. there's, been a, there's been a whole load of stuff, I think, happened in a really short space of time. And, it, oh, and then it almost feels like this last few months has almost been like the calm after that initial storm Mm -hmm. i'd I'd certainly agree with that although the uh, just like the duck on the water the uh, the feet are paddling quite quickly underneath (laughs) the water to uh to try and keep things going and uh and make some of the bigger aspirations uh, a reality um yeah it's been eventful Mm -hmm. i think it'd be interesting you know so there's this period where i think they're sort of sort of national or or pressure or even in terms of contractual timetables being relatively light uh but then we're going to move into the new year and we're sort of waiting for the specs and waiting for the new contract and see what's agreed around that so i think it does feel to me like we might be in the calm before the storm period Mm. I think that's what many people are um, anxious about. I won't say fearful, but I'd say anxious because, uh, yes, it's a five-year contract. Yes, it's been agreed that this is what we're going to do. Um, but in terms of the specification of, of what that is going to be and how that's going to deliver, well, actually, that's still a year-on-year adjustment. And that, and that still makes it kind of this whole, uh, I mean, m- my hope originally was that we wouldn't have this, you know, whole yearly shift that we have in general practice. And actually, 
we are. It's just the finance side of it has been agreed for five years, but in terms of the deliverability, the, the, you know, the benchmarks and all that kind of stuff, that's still happening every few months or yearly cycle kind of thing, which is slightly frustrating, I think. But I think that's what we're going to see in terms of how it shifts in, in the impact it has for all of us. And it feels like the jury's still out a bit, doesn't it? So mm -hmm. I think initially when primary care networks were presented, it was... Um, primary care networks are almost like the saviour of general practice. It's going to be the vehicle by which all the funding's going to come and in which the new roles that general practice desperately needs are going to arrive. And then, you know, wind the clocks forward to where we are today. People aren't sure whether mm -hmm. primary care networks are even making it any better at all. And is that what they're about or are they about something the system is trying to do around integrated care? So it's kind of whether primary care networks can really help core general practice, it feels to me like the jury's still out on that. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that, Ben. Um, one of the things that I've, um, both Gandhi and I, and probably all the clinical directors out there have experienced is um, increased exposure to different parts of the system. We've, yeah. we've been getting invited to so many different uh, meetings, mm -hmm. ICS, ICP, interacting with local, so these different stakeholders, and they've all got um, their own, um, ideas or things that they have been told that primary care networks are the answer to um, and uh, it feels like it's something that the system is now turning to to, mm. to cure all maladies really a bit of a panacea for all the ills of the NHS um, you know I was sitting in a meeting of the I, I, ICP uh, recently and um, not to go into any specifics of course but um, but people have high expectations of primary care networks and I think they often don't understand that in many cases they're you know they're, they're one person for one day a week, uh, beginning to bring on board other resources and other mm -hmm. and other professionals. Um, so, so it's just been interesting um, the sort of the, the hype that's developed in other areas of the health and social care sector, uh, and, and how big the aspirations are, and how many different um, masters um, we seem to have as primary yeah. care network. Um, so that's part of why I've been finding it quite quite daunting, enjoyable, uh, but daunting. I think there's a risk in that, Andy. That if primary care networks don't define their own identity that the system like you say that it's the so the expectations are so high and there's so much that so each each stakeholder has their own expectations of what primary care networks should do that the, the, the potential for them to fail is higher if they're not clear themselves what it is that they want to do so i don't think the what i don't think what pcn should be doing is saying i'm, I'm waiting for the system to kind of decide what they want us to do i think it's about being clear themselves look for, for us to be successful this is what we're going to do and then if anyone asks us we're going to tell them this is what we do and this is what we are i i agree exactly i think yeah. that is that is so important for primary care networks to define their own identity their own purpose and their own objectives because it's very easy to um to get lost in other people's aims and aspirations for primary care networks um, and the thing that um in my experience the other stakeholders um, don't have on their, their their radar or their agenda uh, when they're interacting with primary care networks um, is this whole concept of primary care networks being there to support core general practice and you know support list based general practice. That's I mean it's understandable that that's not on their agenda uh, and that that gets lost. Uh, but uh, you know, it's so important that we keep it on our agenda uh, as uh, as the practices and the primary care network. Uh, leads because there's such a danger that that gets lost and it's so important because if core primary care um, isn't there and isn't strong and mm -hmm. isn't sustainable uh, we've got no hope in answering the other objectives that are, are being asked of us. I mean that's a bit why I think the new sort of specifications that are coming out are going to be so important because if you take the new roles that are coming with primary care networks so are those new roles to support the delivery of core general practice kind of maybe or are they to support the delivery of the new specifications, i.e. extra stuff that's expected for primary care networks to do? And if it ends up looking like it's just the latter, then it's really hard to understand what that contribution to core general practice is. So that's why I think these new specifications and the, the amount that they are trying to extract all the benefit of the new roles is going to be a, a really important point for the sort of development of primary care networks. I, th I think you're right. And um, Gandhi and I, in fact, I don't think you were there. Oh, no, she were there. You're on a different table. Mm -hmm. We were at uh, the King's Fund um, ran um, a day conference about primary care networks. Um, and uh, uh, 
for information really a, a lot of local stakeholders attended including, including mm-hmm. Africa Network Leeds um, and uh, in one of the presentations uh, it was very interesting that they talked about the seven specifications coming through the seven challenges um, and that there was no specific additional funding associated with these additional challenges and that the funding was in the additional roles um, and uh, uh, the room I think some of us had cottoned onto that before, um, mm. but um, there was a little bit of palpable unease in the room at that. Um, so, yeah, so one of those risks, it may be realised, I guess. I mean, that also is critical. I mean, I, I, do, I wonder if that sort of message that there's no funding for the new specs is almost, was almost like a sort of pre-negotiation uh, sort of stance because... I think if it if it does end up being like that, that the the risk of you know mass walking away from PCNs by practices, I think, would be too high. So I just mm-hmm. I just can't see a scenario where NHS England will put all this effort in this year just to see it sort of fall over next year. And we hope not. And we hope that's one of the changes we've seen in the way that NHS England operate in terms of its. Um closer working relationship obviously with our negotiators the gpcs but also with you know general practice per se um but i guess over the past year i know you i mean you've had some amazing interviews in, in your podcast uh, me and andy pretty much listen to you almost every single week i do have to catch up on the last episode that you've done this week i still haven't got around to that one or not and things but oh, you'll, you'll like it Gandhi. it's on some skype visits i know i know which is why i'm keen to listen to it i just I, I've, I've had so many other things happen this week that it's like uh, but hopefully tomorrow that's my day for podcast listening and stuff rather than creation but i guess with all those different interviews i mean what would you say were your top three kind of episodes from your perspective? Well, it's really interesting that, in, you know, we just talked about the year, almost like the year being defined by primary care networks, but the most popular episode that we had of the, of the podcast this year was one we recorded in March with um, a GP in from Northampton, a guy called uh, Tom Hausman. And he talked about, um, he'd introduced a system in his practice of pre-triage protocols. So basically enabling the receptionist to get a sort of brief clinical history so that they could then direct the people, the, the patients through to the, to the most appropriate member of their sort of emergency care clinical team. And so it's really interesting for me that that it still, are there innovative ways of managing the ever-growing workload is still where there's the most interest, even with everything that's going on with yeah. primary care networks. And I suspect probably the, the more recent episode you did, and I'm afraid I can't remember the, the GP's name, but the, the guy who talked about using um, healthcare um, professionals as taking the history um, and then like the GP roving between the rooms, I think that was last week's episode. Um, you know, the contrast from that, I think given a bit more time, that that will probably catch up, I guess, to Tom Hausman's episode. Yeah, that was a guy called, you're right, Dr. Paul Bennett. And he he's they have a system where the healthcare support workers, it, it, in a sense, they basically give each patient a sort of 20, 20 to 30 minute appointment and the GP comes in to do, you know, two to five minutes in the middle of that as the, as the expert opinion. So it kind of works for mm-hmm. GPs, works for the patient, works for the healthcare support works. It's a really, it's a really um, interesting way that they... Um, that they manage their sort of their duty system. I mean, we, it wasn't this year. It was the year before we did a, an episode with Neil Moda. I don't know if you've ever co- come across Neil and his practice is mm-hmm. in Peterborough. Yeah, and uh, and they have just the most incredible system. And so um, and it, so he's the only other place that I've seen doing something similar to, similar to Paul. And that that equally has been a, an episode that continues to be really popular on the podcast. Mm-hmm. So that's two. What's number three then? <laughs> uh, well, I guess so. I guess I, I, the one that you know, you know, like you say, been running the podcast for a while, but was a bit of a game changer for us. Was we we did have Nikki Kanani came on the podcast um, mm-hmm. more or less as soon as the um, GP contract was released to talk about what it what it was and then to explain about primary care networks and what they were going to be, and and that that was, I think, not only good because it was someone turning those you know i don't know about you but i've been in lots of rooms where you talk about the new contract and you start off by saying right who's read it and, and it's, you know there's gps most mm-hmm. haven't read it so to actually have someone 
from NHS England come and say, look, this is what it means. This is what mm -hmm. it's all about. Um, where, you know, historically, I don't know, I don't know how you guys have found it, but sometimes people from NHS England find it hard to get on the podcast just because there's a whole set of missions that they have to get to. So I think Nikki herself has been great taking on that role and sort of opening up NHS England and making it feel a little bit more accessible for practices. Definitely. I mean, I think under Nikki's uh, stewardship, you know, the the interface between NHS England and general practice has improved a little bit, I think mainly because of how responsive she is. Um, I mean, she, she's clearly led in a lot of the ways that people feed into the system and, and more importantly, how she feeds back. And uh, so we were fortunate enough to have her join us for our podcast as well. But we even got to see inside her home and her board game shelves. We did. Yeah, did you? Yeah. She's got a number of copies of Monopoly. Yes, a surprising amount. And, and she's actually due to come to Nottingham, I believe, in May time. So we may have to have a Monopoly game just with Nikki just to see how good she actually is. Um, but yeah, again, that, that continues to be one of our more, more popular episodes then. I think just purely because of you know the information she can share and, and at the end of the day she's a very good speaker as well, which helps. Yeah, she's got great energy. She's enthusiastic. It's so easy to um, become uh, cynical. I feel myself drifting into it sometimes when talking mm. about um, you know after the initial uh, buzz from Primary Care Network subsides. You know, it's it's very easy to start looking at the detail and begin to feel cynical. But but Nikki Kanani can, uh, can can blow that away to a certain extent with mm. her enthusiasm, which I, I really respect. And I just wanted to make an extra point, actually, Ben. Um, before you were talking about, uh, obviously, the impact Nikki's episode had in terms of summarising all that information that was in, you know, the, the GP contract, and obviously the long-term plan came out just a couple of weeks before that as well. Um, one lesson I actually took from the way that you presented that was um, I've actually gone to a lot of our um, kind of locality managers and said to them, look, um, you know, you, you've now got, for example, in Nottingham City, there's nine clinical directors that, you know, she has to share information with and stuff. And actually the realistic part is a lot of times we don't have the time to read the numerous pages of these documents that come out. I mean, you, you know, on average, they can be about a hundred pages long. So one of the things that, you know, I've kind of suggested that, that they look at doing it is when these documents come out, because these people do read them and go through them with a fine tooth comb to find the pluses and the minuses and, and stuff, actually recording their thoughts on it as a mini podcast in a sense. And then they can send that to the clinical directors because it, it encapsulates the um, and captures the, the the pertinent information that we kind of need to know. And clearly, if we want to read into the bits that speak pique our interests, so we can go off and do that. But it, it presents that information in a much more um, usable format rather than having to comb through 100 plus pages that, to be honest, either you remember or you don't, uh, or more importantly, get bored before you get towards the end of it. Because the executive summary sometimes just don't have the context, that they have the guidance, but they don't have the context, I find. But yeah, I took that from the way that you present things with Nikki, really. Yeah, I mean, so it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, those the, the bits that matter on those documents, you kind of, there are, there are certain people, I think, who can sort of pull them out, but they're not obvious for people who are maybe looking at those types of documents for the mm. first time. So I do think there's a need for people to go, okay, it says this, but this is what it means and this is why it's important. And sometimes that, that does need spelling out. I mean, just on the, 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 the podcast point, I met a... Um, a, a PCN clinical director who's working in in Surrey and he was he was saying he enjoyed the podcast but then he says what he what he started to do is he produces a podcast for his practices <laughs> so literally mm -hmm. you know rather than you know like an update or a newsletter he does like you know a, sh a short audio file which sends you yeah. what podcast is and they just so his practices can just listen and they feel like more connected to him because they, they're hearing his voice and um, he says it's working really well yeah. Uh, similarly, I mean, I, I do a tweet um, blog effectively every Friday on what I've been up to over the past week. So um, the challenge with that is I have to finish it off in two minutes and 10 seconds, um, which is sorry, two minutes and 20 seconds. So that does give me a bit of a time frame. Um, so at least people know it's going to be short, but it, it basically encapsulates all the stuff I've been up to and the interesting things we've got done or got coming up, really. That That's a great idea. I hadn't thought about the... Um the time constraint mm. with Twitter as an advantage. That's such a great idea because it, it's something that I'd, I'd sort of aspire to do something like that with my primary care network, but I've not quite found the time or got around to it yet. But mm -hmm. actually using Twitter and keeping the time of it down to 220 seconds is perfect because then I don't have to worry about um, having to include every single thing that's been going on. Yeah. And that'll really, really help with uh, the element of perfectionism that I sometimes <laughs> have, like many people. Great idea, Gandhi. 
I mean, if I was allowed to mention one more episode, um, there was a guy we had on called Paul Deffley, who's a, he's a GP um, from the South Coast, and he works in an organisation called Practice Un- Unbound, and they've done quite a lot of supporting joint working mm-hmm. across practices. And uh, it was a really, for me, probably the most, probably the the interview that I had where I learned the most, you know, because I spend my days supporting practices work together. But I, I, I don't, I, I mean, I talk about this quite a bit, so apologies if people have already heard it, but he talked about a pharmacist working ac- across um, different practices. So it was the same pharmacist working to the same protocols and he was working in these two practices that are like next door to each other. And in one practice, they were, it worked really well. And the practice um, said they, they don't know how they ever managed without him. And in the other practice, they were saying, oh, well, we're not really sure. And we feel like the pharmacist is adding work rather than taking work away. Mm-hmm. And so it was really interesting to kind of explore with him. What is it about the practices then that make one practice think I can't live without a pharmacist and another practice think I think the ad work don't take work away? And I think the answer to that is how you approach the role in integration, isn't it? So it's, you know, if you just see these kind of things as bolt-ons, then inevitably they just end up creating more work for either side or, you know, both. And whereas actually if you you look at the processes and, and how you can actually integrate that into the workflow that's where you get the gains in terms of making everybody's lives, both you know, clinicians and more importantly patients, just so much more easier. Really. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that episode, Ben, because that's probably um, the episode of your podcast that I have found most helpful uh, mm-hmm. this year. Um, those, that, that series of, um, of episodes that you've done, and you've continued along the same, same thing really with PCMs, but mm-hmm. in the initial flurry around PCMs, um, you put out some great, content that i think was really helpful to a lot of primary care network clinical directors um and that episode focusing on um working across practices yeah. within the context of pharmacy was one i think was quite wide to listen to because um An- ankish who um, is helping us recruit our clinical pharmacists in nottingham uh via uh ncgpa the local federation had, had listened to the podcast mm-hmm. as well um the pharmacists that we ultimately recruited and listened to the podcast and mentioned it in her interview um helped us all sort of be on the same page and think about yeah they need a good induction yeah. you know they need to be orientated introduced yep. care yeah. given to how they spend their time that the job is uh, is doable for them and mm-hmm. won't drive them crazy particularly with a primary care network like mine with eight practices you've got to really carefully think about how you structure um, their time uh, so that was a really useful episode I definitely recommend people listen to that if they really? haven't already so I guess Ben we, we've talked about what's happened over the past year um, what are your predictions moving forward because obviously we, we now move forward with um, a new well a confirmed government shall we say um, and we move forward into potentially you know the changes that come with the new contract and like you said the specifications and stuff but where do you see things shifting in the next 12 months well, I mean, we touched on it earlier, didn't we? And I, I think we've got this huge uh, sort of pinch point coming in February when the new um, specifications come out, you know, as part of the new GP contract for PCNs. And I, and I think that is potentially going to be quite a difficult time for PCNs because I just given the sort of, like you say, the, the, the sort of noise that has been around about there being no funding for those specs. So whatever that ends up, it, they're not mm-hmm. going to be hugely funded. And then, it, and five specifications all starting in the year where, you know, you have, there haven't been mm-hmm. any this year. So that kind of acceleration from kind of set up into not just delivering one or two things, but five things. I think it's going to be a real challenge. And I think the sort of importance of trying to keep core general practice on board with primary care networks when there's that onus on delivery of primary care networks is going to be is going to be potentially difficult so like i say it feels to me like we're kind of in the calm before the storm and i think when these when this when the new specifications come out it'll it will potentially mark the sort of end of the honeymoon phase of primary care mm-hmm. networks and we may already be past that but i think we'll definitely be the end of it then and we'll be into okay can can this way of working of practices working together through primary care networks as units 
be something that can be of advantage to practices and the system or is or is it going to be just a bridge too far too quickly i think it's a really critical time mm. so the end of the honeymoon for primary care networks um, and uh, so when we reach that point ben uh, so obviously you've thought you've thought about that as a prediction um mm-hmm. how how do you how would you recommend that primary care network uh, clinical leads like myself and gandhi um face that have you had any thoughts on on how we might meet that challenge well of course the thing we've been i mean it's interesting so i always ask um people who come on the podcast so if you had any advice for a primary care network what would be your main piece of advice and um i did an interview recently with uh, becky malby and mm-hmm. who, who you, you'll all know she's um that that'd be out in january but again she just talks about the importance of um networks being really clear on their purpose and what it is they're trying to achieve mm-hmm. so i think for networks it's saying okay we have that ready so when the new specifications and then in the new guidance comes out then it's thinking about how can we use those to deliver our purpose so how are we going to make that work for us mm-hmm. rather than a kind of we're in a sort of blank space waiting to be told what to do next and it all feels overwhelming so it's about how can primary care networks take control of it when it comes out and make it work for the practices that uh, are the main constituents to start off with as well as improving the outcomes for the local population rather than it feeling like general practice is overwhelmed and this is making it more overwhelming which i think is where the big risk sits Merry Christmas, everyone. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't think we can really respond to that, really, isn't it? Yeah. Actually, I think I think one tip I would I would give one thing that's been really really helpful in Nottingham because mm-hmm. not everyone listening to this podcast is you know will be around Nottingham. People will be up and around the country. Uh, is uh, I think uh, developing a network of networks mm-hmm. is is really really helpful because it can be quite isolating. Um, being a primary care network clinical director, um, you know, even you know, I'm sort of feeling that a little bit in Nottingham, mm-hmm. um, but at least we've got strong connections with the other primary care networks and yeah. clinical leads um, across the city with our regular Zoom mm-hmm. meetings and regular contacts. And that's really, really helpful for resilience and sharing ideas and mm-hmm. pooling resources. So I think that would be my, my, my tip really. It doesn't address those challenges directly, but I think no. it helps improve the resilience and effectiveness of primary care networks. So that would be, be my tip for what it's worth. I mean, I think, I think that's the kind of, you know, in terms of predictions, I think that idea of a network of networks or a federation. So I think if you've already got a federation, the federation essentially should be becoming a network of networks. But so that sense of networks working together, I think next year that will go from a kind of nice to have, feels like it adds some support to kind of essential because trying to do it on your own at that kind of scale, I think is going to feel increasingly difficult. That's, I mean, that's something I think we've noticed in, in Nottingham because we had a fairly yeah. fairly mature network in Nottingham City General Practice Alliance. And um, uh, from my perspective, I, I work within Nottingham City General Practice Alliance, so a declaration of interest there. Mm. But I think that's been really, really helpful for primary care networks in, in Nottingham, uh, having that ready-made organisation to take on the risk of employment and managing finances um, and hopefully do much more um, to support primary care networks and sort mm. of even perhaps morph into a... Uh, you know uh, supplier of services you know provider element for primary care networks has been really really useful for us in Nottingham. Definitely agree Uh, I mean uh, I'm not part of the alliance that Andy mentioned but uh, apart from being a practice member um, but in terms of uh, having that resource available to us has been actually really useful and the network and networks kind of thing that I mean I talked about that with you Ben on my episode when you had me over and stuff and how tech can also help with that so we love talking about tech on this podcast mm-hmm. and you know video conferencing is a method and route to try and support practices and individuals Ben I've got another another question for you um similar and, than, Andy think, sorry could I just oh, say one thing about federations before you do that because I think of course there's, there's an interesting thing that's happened with federations this year that sort of Federations kind of listed as the place where, you know, practices who wanted to work together in sort of filling the at scale place for general practice, not everywhere, but in lots of areas. And then suddenly primary care networks came along as a contractual requirement and so sort of moved into that space. And so in lots of places, I think there was this kind of tension between primary care networks and 
federations in a kind of we know, we're not really sure what each other's um, role is. But I think um, as, as places have got used to the fact that look, primary care networks exist, one and two, primary care networks still need help. They can't operate on their own, even though they're you know technically at scale. Then I think the sort of thing we're getting to now, I think in, in, in more places, and I think we'll increasingly get to next year is is that federations have this role of enabling networks to flourish so i don't think it's if you have a federation they they're trying to control networks or you know they take stuff off and leave others almost like negotiating what networks do what the federations do i think more it's that federations have this underpinning role of support to enable networks to flourish and succeed and so hopefully we can continue on that journey i think which will be a really positive move into the next year yeah, and I think I would just add because we I've sort of experienced that first firsthand um, in, in my own experiences being involved with the federation and then coming on board with the um, with the um, primary care networks. Um, I remember having some conversations initially when primary care networks came out, um, uh, not necessarily with people within the federation, but just more generally. And, and people were saying, "So is this is this the end for federations now? Mm -hmm. You know, are they are they yesterday's news? You know, it doesn't look like they're." Um, you know, receiving the same level of, uh, you know, support or airtime uh, with NHS England. And, and also it, um, I, you know, sometimes I have to wear quite a, a business hat, you know, with the Federation because of the way it's structured. Um, and, um, you know, in some ways you could have perceived primary care networks as a, as a threat potentially, um, you know, mm. federations were, uh, had the expectation that they were perhaps uh, the target of choice for funding to deliver uh, primary care services at scale in certain areas or certainly general practice focused uh, primary care services at scale, you know, within cities or wherever they existed. And, um, you know, there was a, a period of sort of confusion and wondering, is this, you know, is this a threat to the business model of federations? Does this mean that we don't need federations anymore? Um, but then that, that actually very quickly evolved um, in Nottingham um, into a feeling that actually um, it's about collaboration. And Definitely. And actually, within Nottingham, um, they've got eight primary care networks. Each primary care network, the biggest, Gandhi's over sixty thousand uh, patients, is is fairly big. But actually, uh, you know, it would be a challenge even for you know for a, a primary care network of that sort of size. You could go for the lead uh, practice employer model, but mm -hmm. that lead practice uh, will be taking on quite a significant amount of additional staff. Yep. There are always concerns about how recurrent the funding will be for primary care networks, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and and once the funding, if the funding uh, is withdrawn or runs out, um, you know, those staff are still employed and, um, you know, and, and that lead practice is yeah. responsible for them. You can come up with agreements to share the responsibility, but um, it's an uncomfortable place, you know, for some practices to be. Um, so I, I and, and I think other people locally have reached the conclusion that really if, if the Federation didn't exist already, then the eight practices might actually be having conversations about forming a, uh, an entity with limited liability to control some of those uh, contractual employment risks that's co-owned by uh, the practices or the primary care networks that can be used uh, to employ um, staff at the scale of the city coming eight primary care networks because that's a good um, size to share risk and actually uh, we were quite fortunate because we'd already done that a few years ago and mm -hmm. created um, the federation so so I think actually there's a great deal of synergy um, uh, between uh, the federation model and the primary care network model uh, in my opinion locally. Yeah, I mean I've been working with a, a federation of networks in, um, in Redbridge in, in northeast London and and so the, the model there developed so that the, the, there was a, a federation um, historically and the primary care networks have become like formal subcommittees of the federation so they are so they get like a entity status because they're part of um, a limited liability organization but it means as well they don't have to have contracts with the federation to deliver things for them where they're hosted because mm -hmm. they are the federation because the federation and the networks are all part of one um, they're just one entity together yeah. which is an interesting model that's an interesting way of doing it mm. so ben i was about to ask you what are yeah. you so that was a prediction for next year mm -hmm. uh but what are you excited about so that's sort of um uh, the expectations are more positive answer i guess but what are you what are you excited about for 2019 well i guess Oh, 2020. Sorry, we're going 2020. into 2020. Gandhi just looked at me there. Yeah. 
the, I guess the um, the the thing we've been struggling with in general practice is the workload challenge, and that's been you know exacerbated the whole time by less and less GPs. And, and the thing we're going to see potentially this year is with the um, with the, with the so, so obviously for this year for primary care networks it's been the link worker and the pharmacist but then next year we're, we're into a, a much wider way, array of roles with uh, more freedom for networks to choose the roles that they want so i think we've got this big opportunity of these new roles coming in next year and I, what i think is potentially exciting is the impact that could have i think Clearly, you know, there's challenges with introducing new roles and I don't I don't underestimate that. But I think if next year that could just see us start to turn the corner to say, you know what, it's it is just starting to feel a little bit better. It's still going to be tough this time next year, but it, if it's starting to feel a little bit better, I just think that would be great for general practice when just every year it's felt like it's got harder and harder for so many years now. I, I agree. I'd love to see that happen. I'm, I'm probably slightly more skeptical that I think a year is probably still not going to be enough time frame for us to see that. And obviously, that also depends on how things happen in the wider scale. Um, I mean, we've seen obviously the challenges that um, you know medicine shortages have, have created over the past years. It went from being a, a, a semi-regular problem to almost a daily occurrence that is just increasingly causing frustrations for patients for clinicians for pharmacists for everyone almost and and you know those kind of external things that are coming in as well are just multiplying the the workload challenges that we're facing and then be interesting to see how those kind of things hopefully resolve with some sort of future change with the national picture um i guess <laughs> what about you andy are you excited about the new roles um, yes and, and no. Um, again, I think for, for some of the new roles, um, they're still a little bit un, untested in terms of, mm. you know, how, how and whether and if um, they, they will help, um, you know, general practice deliver A, these new specifications and ease the workload on general practice. I think a lot of um, what's come through with primary care networks perhaps doesn't have mm. the evidence base. Um, that um that can assure us that they will be helpful um although of course sometimes you have to try things but but i wonder if some of the new roles are coming through um a little bit quickly but it's a very good question ben yeah i think i am excited actually <laughs> um uh, i think paramedics are going to be interesting if mm -hmm. we can recruit them and get them i think um a place where they may be helpful is in um home visiting obviously potentially around if it's still part of a contract. care homes if oh gosh well the lmc have said yeah. it shouldn't be haven't they home visiting that, that, but that's i think that's an entirely different uh, debate <laughs> yeah, i think it is um, but uh, I, so i'm quite excited about that um I'm, i continue to be excited about the pharmacist i think that's mm. one of the more mature roles um where it's much easier to see how they slot in with the team so i continue to be excited about those um yeah, I'm excited, but my mind's sort of spinning with how how to make it all work. Yeah, I think it's interesting, it's interesting isn't it? because I think the there. I mean, I've spoken to enough practices for all the roles to be convinced that it, each of those roles can have a significant impact. But it, equally, there are other places that have also introduced thermals and they haven't had an impact. So what mm. it, what it tells me back to our conversation about you know Paul Deffley interview is that it's actually not will the role or will the role not have an impact it's, mm. it's it's within the gift of the practices so i think the mindset to think about is we can make these roles have a really big impact and it's not so much do the roles work it's if we make the roles work well enough it will have an impact and i think it's trying to take yeah. that into the control rather than it feeling like it's somehow out of the control of the practices and i definitely agree with that so, so in terms of the roles themselves i do think they're going to add a lot of value to what practices and networks can achieve definitely the pharmacists are, i think like andy said they're a bit more mature role and a bit more tried and tested so i think people can see the value they can have in terms of skill sets and things i think um, first contact physios have real potential at helping mm. out with some of the challenges we face in primary care because you know the the short-term impact that we have in terms of um, workload with MSK issues and that kind of stuff. Actually, these can be really debilitating for patients. 
Um, and often it, it, what they need is not just a doctor to say, yeah, this is a problem. They also need the treatment, but getting that treatment can take four to six weeks before they even start down a physio route. And actually that that's what leads to increasing problems. You got, yeah, Andy? Yeah. And I was, I was going to highlight that we, um, we, we had first contact physio, didn't we? A few mm. years ago in Nottingham. Um, did you have that at your practice? We didn't know. We, we had it at our practice so um it was part of a trial mm. and um we had um a session a week of um, a physio provided um by uh, funded by the pilot and employed mm. by um city care who provide a lot of the district and nursing services in nottingham and they were based um in practices in our patch uh, and receptionists could book straight in uh, if patients presented with a musculoskeletal problem and that was really really helpful actually um mm. from a workload perspective um and also from a patient experience uh, perspective and shortening that journey to mm. get into um, a physio which often with a, a simple musculoskeletal problem is where you need to be is that was really helpful so mm. actually it, it's good that you mentioned that role and I, I'm, I am excited about that role definitely and I guess the other ones coming through are in terms of like you said the paramedics I think they can have a clear benefit in terms of one of the more challenging aspects of primary care which is the home visit which as we said is up for debate at this moment in time and then we've got the mental health workers in terms of first contact mental health support workers. I'm, I forget the terminology, um, but I think clearly in some areas that's going to have huge benefits. Although there is this crossover between the mental health service itself. And I think that's an interesting um, you know, dichotomy that needs to be discussed because I know um, speaking with some people, you know, there is still this perception of this view, you know, this, um, uh, what's the word, but not barrier, um, Two different sides of the coin in terms of mental health and primary care because of the, the clear funding differences that they have and that actually if you try and blur the lines is that right and i know definitely there are places where they say that's that's fine that works really well and i guess fleetwood uh, healthy fleetwood's a great example of that but i also know other places and, and things where they think that actually crossing those boundaries means that um you know the funding gets a bit murky and then how does that work moving forward i was an interesting on the King's Fund day, I was at an interesting uh, discussion on the mental health table. Mm. And uh, one of the things that emerged, and it's actually present in, in some of the data from our primary care network really is, um, we so our primary care network operates in quite a deprived area uh, in Bullwell in Nottingham. Um, and we feel that we have a lot of mental health issues and, mm. and we do, uh, but actually our rate of um, psychotic, serious mm. mental health is actually very, very similar to the rest of the city mm. and the rest of the patch. And what we're actually experiencing more of um, is non-psychotic mental health, mm. depression, anxiety. And it became apparent at the discussion at this round table uh, that actually those cases that are perhaps we feel are causing um, a lot of um, strain on our workforce and workload um, are actually not cases that would really be taken on by the mental health services um, uh, proper I say do my uh, inverted commas in, in the air mm. uh, and that actually they are things that are suitable to remain in, in general practice it's just there's a lot of them and we struggle with them mm. um, so actually um, I, I'm not I'm not I, I'm more comfortable with with uh, employing those mental health workers, and things. that's they don't necessarily belong in mm. in the mental health um, service. You know, I think they're more in the realm of um, of general practice and social care interventions mm. and social prescribing. Um, I just thought that was an interesting observation. Yeah, agree. I, I noticed neither of you mentioned uh, physician associates. I was coming on to that one, actually. So my last point was going to be about the PAs and actually asking you, Ben, because um, so, so I actually have a pharmacist, uh, sorry, a physician associate in our practice. We're, we're the first one in Nottingham to have one. And I cannot imagine my working day without you know her role in the practice at this moment in time. But one of the things I am struggling to understand is how that will work from a network perspective, especially as it starts. So I can understand having potentially a team of physician associate, how that could really work, work across a network. But, you know, if you take my network of seven practices, 66,000 patients, I, I'm really struggling to see how I can get one person to do effect with that particular role. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think you're probably slightly unusual, Gandhi, in that... That's not the when, first time I've heard that. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I talk to practice about the new roles, I would say the role that there's the most scepticism about would be the 
physician associates mm -hmm. and so i think but equally uh, i have spoken to other gps who have got physician associates and, and like you they get to the point where they say look they, they actually can have the most value because they can take it feels mm -hmm. like they can take the most amount of my workload away from me compared to any of the other roles and so you do have this kind of those who experience it and those who don't and I, I i mean as a general point about the roles so there are some networks who sort of go in with the mindset so let's say we're seven practices for anything we get into the network there has to be some sort of equal share at any mm -hmm. one time this sort of equity principle that sometimes isn't, isn't even spoken but is like there so you couldn't possibly have one of the roles working in one practice or in two practices and not in the other five but i don't think it's necessarily a helpful thing especially if you know there are going to be 20 25 new roles coming in over a period of time mm -hmm. and what you're trying to do potentially is have a really big impact on the workload of individual practices to say mm -hmm. well let's kind of stage it and agree between us how we're going to stage it and if the way of working it with say position associates is they work in one practice or in two practices and then the next one works in a different set of practices or maybe three of those practices don't even want the position associates for, for whatever reason mm. that, that i don't i think that's okay and I, and I think sometimes it's about um not having to everything to be the same because it feels like that can dilute the impact in some instances and it can kind of get in the way it's like this one practice doesn't want a position associates so that somehow means nobody can have one because they've decided it's not a good mm. investment does that make sense it does, uh, and, uh, and I agree with the, the principle of it. Like you said, it's sometimes trying to get the buy-in is, is the challenge. Um, so I guess um, I, I know of one of our networks in the Nottingham City area where they've kind of taken that more um, dichotomy approach in the fact because their area is one area is quite heavily focused with the elderly population. The other area is quite heavily focused with the younger families population. So what they've basically said is that, well, we're going to go out for two different roles and we're not going to share them. But we're going to have, for example, in the elderly population, they're going to actually focus on having an admiral nurse to help with all their patients with dementia because they've got higher prevalence of it. And in the um, area with you know younger families and that kind of stuff, that's where they're going to focus their social prescriber, link worker, whatever term you want to use, because that's meeting the needs of the populations better. And yes, they're not having the same resource, but actually they don't necessarily need the same resource. I think that's a good point. And I, I think there's also an opportunity with the um, the co-funding model, the um, you know, 30, 70 percent model, um, because I, I think particularly in the early years, practice uh, PCNs may not be um, using all of their you know, allocated um, central funding mm -hmm. for the roles. Um, it's going to take time to recruit staff and certainly uh, at the point where practices need to start putting their hand back in their own pocket for money when that one pound 50 plus potentially the one pound 76 however you want to cut that um is gone and practices might need to fund things mm -hmm. themselves i think that's where um individual practices or small numbers of practices within primary care networks could be permitted to um have a physician's assistant if they wanted to contribute the 30 percent themselves mm. then the primary care network could facilitate that and i think that might actually allow for um for pockets of innovation even within primary care networks and then there's also the effect that if um, if, if gandhi's practice has got a physician's assistant and that's co-funded by the primary care network and that's really useful mm. well maybe everyone wouldn't have wanted a phys physician's assistant to begin with but actually because gandhi's practice has it made maybe, maybe will want one Mm. as well so uh, i think there are opportunities there uh, by saying not everyone needs to um have have the same offer from the mm. primary care network and i think particularly if practices are co-funding a little bit themselves to hopefully get some real genuine value um then they would view that and those roles differently mm. I mean, it's interesting i think i think it's underestimated nationally the barrier that that 30 percent funding from practices is causing and you, yeah. you you look at this stuff around you know i don't know what i don't know what it's like in your area but certainly in places where i've i've been working that the, the sort of pressure almost from ccgs and uh, the system on the pcns about have you employed your staff yet have you employed your link work yet have you employed your pharmacist yet is like almost relentless because nationally they want to tell this story that all these roles have been employed and and, and utilized and yet 
Um, and then you get into this piece around, well, if you don't use up your allocation of um, staff, then they can be used by other networks, which kind of makes you suddenly want them when you hadn't, want, when you hadn't wanted them. But I think it underplays this kind of reticence that I think is more common than is nationally recognised. Perhaps again, we know what we're not even sure we want these roles because mm. we're not sure we want to be committing ourselves to, to, yeah. chip, to chipping I in. Think it also gives an interesting narrative to that whole concept of. So you mentioned earlier that you know that these extra roles are potentially meant to be funding the extra work that we are required to deliver as part of the specifications and stuff. Whereas actually, if practices are having to contribute to those roles, there is a clear line then that actually those new roles have to be doing something to improve the way that those practices function and work. And if they're not, then like you said, those practices aren't going to turn around and say, fine, we're going to continue funding them. And that's where the, 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 the part, you know, the, the whole concept of the network funding, I think really, like you said, it, it's something that hasn't really been explored as to how willing people are to take that. And I think in some areas they'll, they'll jump at the chance because it's supportive funding. I think some places they'll see that as an absolute threat because they're struggling to manage um, you know, even now, so forking up even 30% of somebody's um, workload um, is something that they're going to struggle to to really achieve. And then clearly you're going to have places in the middle, which I think potentially is where we fit at the moment, uh, and, you know, looking to see how we can manage that effectively for our areas, basically. I mean, there's a big difference, isn't there, between asking a practice to say, we're going to give you something worth £10,000, but you only have to pay £3,000 for it, Mm. feels like a great deal versus we're setting up this shiny network service and we want you to co contribute 3000 because you're in the networks you've got to pay your share mm -hmm. so it, i think it's that kind of understanding the, the difference between those two is important i think thinking about the new roles for the networks mm. yeah i think the primary care networks if if funded in that way they, they need to deliver something you know back to practices to help with their core core business and mm. not just be seen as um doing addition these additional um uh, service specifications but funded to the tune of 30 percent by general practice i think if if the optics begin to look like that then uh, i think uh the uh, the endeavor uh, maybe on the course to failure um so uh yes yeah, depends on how people deploy them in their well, own primary care network and, and what the expectations are yes yeah, so which brings you back to the importance of these new specs because if the new specs say you've got these new roles and this is what they all need to be doing and you're thinking hold on a minute i'm already chipping in you know 30 percent for these new roles yet suddenly it's doing a load of stuff that is additional versus um the specs are kind of separate from the roles and you can use those roles to actually support core general practice so you know what's in them is it's not just if they're funded it's how much they use these roles as well i think that's important <laughs> And on that bombshell, we're going to move away from primary care networks, I think. Okay, <laughs> enough, just, enough already. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 you know, it's been a seismic thing that's happened to primary care. We've definitely, I think, given it plenty of attention. Um, but it's amazing having you here, Ben. And one of the things that me and Andy like to do to uh, basically all of our guests, we, we always ask these two questions to everybody that comes on. Um, so we wanted to get your opinion on, on these factors. So uh, number one is a two-parter. Um, and we haven't pre-warned you of these questions, so a little bit of thinking on the fly. Um, so number one is, what is your favourite or most preferred work-based application? Mm, well, <laughs> I, I guess for me, and it probably is going to be different for, for most people, is... No, this is all about you. This is just it, for you. Yeah, so for me, it, it's definitely Dropbox because my team is virtual and we deal with obviously with the audio files and lots of other stuff stuff that is mm -hmm. massive and so for us to be able to work on things collectively and shift you know large files around the, the thing that we've that we find most useful and we do all our work through is, is dropbox so mm -hmm. i don't i don't know how that that works for everyone but for us we found that really really helpful in fact i don't know how you know in, in the commonly... old days when you and it's definitely a commonly mentioned thing in terms of the, old, the cloud computing effectively. So we've had the people talk about similar sort of platforms and stuff before. Um, and, and you're right, it does have the opportunity to really help. It's a shame there isn't a Dropbox for the NHS, um, really, because that, I think, potentially could be um, really useful, um, you know, being able to share information without having to worry about, you know, um, the, 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 the provider licenses and all that kind of stuff and actually being able to share information effectively. 
uh, mm. rather than email, which is the current default mechanism. I'm going to put a shout out for Office 365, uh, which uh, <laughs> it appears we can access now with our NHS mail accounts. Uh, uh, it's actually very good, very similar functionality with, uh, with OneDrive to Dropbox. And I've been having success using it on my NHS computers don't tell NHIS so I'm, maybe I'm breaking a rule but uh, it appears to be I think it appears to be mark. supported yeah. um, <laughs> so I've been impressed by that I mean I'm mean, interested in another application that I use quite a lot obviously is, is Skype so a lot of a lot of the podcasts we record by Skype and you would be amazed by the amount of GPs who cannot use Skype <laughs> and mm. have to and have to go you know have to get their uh, I don't know someone in their practice or normally their daughter or their son to set mm. it up for them so that they can actually record the podcast. Mm. And, and we talked about the whole Skype versus other platforms uh, preference thing before in, in some of our podcasts and stuff. So I guess um, the next question we had is on a similar vein. So we talked about your favorite work based app and stuff. So what is your favorite non work based app? And that can be anything. Ooh, my favorite non-work-based app. I was looking at my phone here and see what I use all the time. <laughs> Those person's actually got their phone out when we've yeah. asked that question. Uh, is the, it? Uh, Queen time. The, <laughs> where is that mostly spent? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if this counts, but um, the, the big shift that I made this year was from reading books to listening to books. Mm -hmm. And so I have uh, an Audible subscription and mm -hmm. I find that, you know, because I, I do have to do a lot of traveling to like work in different places around the country. And um, I, I, I find I'm able to consume a, a lot more in terms of books now than I was, I've been able to uh, in the past, just because mm -hmm. I can, I can listen when I'm, commuting so i don't know if that that's the kind of thing you had in mind but certainly that's the that's that's great ben what's your what's your favorite book of the year well <laughs> i um i play tennis okay and uh, there's a book called zen tennis and it's all about the uh mental game of tennis and i found it really really helpful so <laughs> it's been uh diff difficult to put into uh, practice, I have to say, but I guess I maybe throw my racket around a little bit less. <laughs> uh, okay. More zen, more peaceful. Wow. And then our, our second question, uh, kind of thing that we love to ask, and, and um, so, yeah, we'll give you a couple of seconds, I think, to think about this one. Um, so imagine tomorrow morning you had the opportunity to have a meeting with Matt Hancock, and he turned around to you and said, Ben, here you go, here's 100 million pounds. You can spend this on health tech in any way that you want. I'm going to clear all the red tape for you. None of that exists anymore. How would you spend it? So it's, it's a really good question, isn't it? And, um, and you've probably talked on your podcast about uh, how you would define tech mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and what it actually is. Um, but the... Uh, the interesting thing for me in um, the work that I do with practice, often it's like how to practice work together and how to, how to um, so different organizations work together. And, and it's, it, it always comes down to trust. Mm -hmm. So do people trust each other? And if they trust each other, then they're much more likely to do uh, a whole set of things. And so, I don't know exactly what I would spend it on, but um, it would definitely be around a process that would enable tr enough trust to be built that we could actually get the uh, sort of, because the barrier, it seems to me in general practice is around data sharing. And a lot of that seems to come from the practices and it's because they don't trust the people that they're that they are asked to share the data with but i think it would be beneficial both for the practices and for the system if we were able to get to that so i don't know exactly how that money would be deployed but it would be okay. on a way of um building enough trust to 
enable that data sharing to actually be put in place that we could actually then build and do a load of the things that I think we, we have the set technological capability to do, but we're stopped because people just won't let us. Mm -hmm. Definitely interesting. And I think potentially really valuable in a sense. I think trust is a definite part of it. I think also culture is um, a huge part. And it, once you break down the barriers between cultures, between different places, then the trust follows with that. Or maybe it's the other way around. I don't know. Be interesting to see. Have you guys got data sharing agreements all signed in your networks? Uh, we're in we're in process. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but um, I, I don't think there's. I, I think I, I think we'll get there. Actually, mm. um, that I think in principle people um, are are on board. So with it within the primary care network and with yeah. the federation, um, I think when other partners start to be brought in i think we'll start to have those conversations mm. and uh, hit, hit up against those barriers of trust but currently yeah. the pra practice for, for the most part are fairly trusting of one another yeah i think i think so but I, I haven't seen that be a problem yet um like andy said i think when we start looking outside of the kind of primary care field i think that's where potentially some of the um challenges may come in um, but hopefully, like you said, if you can build the trust, if you can build that ability that actually this is a benefit for the patient, this is a benefit for the you know the stakeholders mm -hmm. and stuff, then actually it's a win-win, isn't it, really? Well, I mean, these are tough questions. Are, are, are we done with the uh, spot questions? Or yeah, we we're done with the spot <laughs> questions. You can relax. You can, you can take a deep breath and go back to your zen place. Yeah, you know perfect, know? perfect. This is the, Chris, this is the, the Christmas slash New Year episode. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask... I'm going to ask Gandhi, actually, because I'm curious um, okay. if you've got um, any pr prediction, either uh, an excited about or a, you know, or a negative crash and burn prediction for, for 2019 Ooh. and 2020. So I'm going to give you two. Um, so I, I am excited about the way that the digital revolution is going to come to primary care. Um, obviously, we see that from 2021, April 2021, it becomes a mandated part of the contract that practices have to offer digital um, consultation to patients. Um, including video consultation so I am excited but at the same time anxious about it you know there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done for the majority of primary care whilst we definitely have some market leaders in that area we also have many practices that have a long way to go to get to that stage um, I guess in terms of cautions yeah it's the workload isn't it you know we're, we're heading into a nasty winter by the looks of it you know the past few weeks have been oh my god they've been awful in practice in terms of cough colds and all that kind of stuff and the workload it's created is just astronomical um and how we fare through that because the networks and stuff just aren't i don't think mature enough in most places to cope with that extra support so you know we've definitely got some challenges coming our way in the next six months at the very least i see and it'd be interesting to see how we navigate through that mm. so doom and gloom with a little bit of peppering of optimism <laughs> Great. Well, that's what you normally expect from me, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think um, I'll, I'll I'll give you two predictions as well. Go for so, Andy. Um, so I think there will be um, a, a collective narrative and news story, um, a bit like you were saying, Ben. Actually, primary care networks on the ropes. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and that'll be primary care networks as organisations. And I think um, there may be, and this depends how it goes. So this is mm -hmm. a fear, really. Primary care networks on the ropes. Primary care network clinical directors burnt out. That's a risk. So we need to try and mitigate that uh, from the outset, I think, because I think the demands and expectations are just so great. And I think it, it'll be executed really well in some parts of the country mm. and in some parts of, um, of our areas. Uh, but in other places, uh, just because there's so much variation in where people are mm. starting from with clinical networks, I think, yeah. I think it, it'll be um, a, a much bigger challenge in some areas so i think there'll be some kind of narrative collective story in pulse and the other outlets mm -hmm. about that um and uh the other thing perhaps uh perhaps more positive it depends how you look at this um i think we'll be talking even less about artificial intelligence uh in general practice uh that last year um as in 2018 there was a lot about artificial yeah. intelligence general practice and Babylon were just coming onto the scene and there was a lot of um, hype um, around their products and other similar things. And that seems to have died down a bit in 2019. Mm -hmm. And I think we won't hear very much about it in 2020. I think uh, we're going to go into another medical AI winter, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is, uh, is, 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 it, up, is up to you. I think I it's mean, my, my prediction on that, 
happened is that I would go the, the other way. I think we've had a quiet year and I think we'll have a, a very noisy year, I think. I so think we'll, so we'll we'll meet back here in December. That's right. In, yeah, I think I think we I, 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 I think yeah. just the way that whole Babylon thing is playing through and the likelihood of them then trying to develop uh sort of local sort of place-based locations to meet the new requirements and then mm -hmm. um, expanding rapidly on that basis and the risk that then will bring for everyone I think I think we'll see we'll see that happen next year yeah well, I don't think I so I think I think Babylon uh, is here to stay it might be a story but the the technology of the AI I I think is, okay. is well overhyped but I think um, dis disruptors with disruptive uh, business models uh yeah, I'm with, you. I'm with you on that one. We may well see mm. more of that. Cool. So, Ben, uh, I guess if our listeners wanted to, you know, make contact with you, get in, you know, in touch and stuff, how would you suggest it would be the best place for them to do that? Yeah, so um, email me. I'm ben at Ockham, so C-K-H-A-M, dot healthcare. Have a look at the website, Ockham dot healthcare. Um, sign up to the, um, we, have a, we have a free weekly newsletter, so just sign up to that, and uh, it's a great way of staying in touch. Definitely. And I found it really useful and um, not only listening to the podcast on you know, a weekly basis, but also like you said that the blog content and stuff, it, it's a useful and helpful addition to, you know, all the other kind of stuff that's been going on. And I, I must admit, um, I'm not quite sure how I would have got through the whole primary care clinical journey network journey if it hadn't been for, for, for your podcast basically i was just thinking the same thing actually i think i think you've done a great service actually to um to those people trying to make primary care networks mm. work so uh, on, on, on behalf of uh, of everyone i think th thank you very much for your content ben it's, i think everyone's been finding it really really helpful so mm. thank you very much thanks both it's very kind cool so thank you for joining us and everyone as always if you want to contact us we're available on twitter facebook linkedin youtube pretty much every platform going as you know i've got the internet plugged into my brain and Andy's slowly and surely joining me on I'm most of those platforms you. yeah um, definitely make sure you subscribe to the podcast we would love to hear your comments as well and loved it if you could leave us a review particularly on the itunes page so you'll see the link of that down below and everything and as always we're here to try and help save you and your patient's time with taking out your primary care and learning Catch you in the next episode. Okay, thanks so much. Bye-bye.